hello yes uh, okay so we uh, have uh, we are ready and we have started streaming on youtube so i guess we can start uh, shreyash can you give a small introduction about sir and the topic of today and then sir can start with his presentation okay so uh, hello everybody today we have with us dr vincent venin uh, sir is currently a permanent researcher at the astroparticle and cosmology laboratory apc a university of paris and today sir will be giving an interesting talk about primordial black holes and gravitational waves for metric preheating so please continue hi so thank you very much for the uh, introduction and for the invitation to to talk here it's a uh, It's a great pleasure. So indeed, I'm going to talk about primordial black holes uh, in connection with the early universe, and in particular, um, a phase in the early universe which is called preheating. Um, so, why well, is not? Yeah. So because this is a topic which is maybe not um, in the um, expertise of uh, everyone uh, attending this presentation, what I'm going to do is spend some time in the beginning introducing. the sort of uh, cosmological background in which uh, uh, the discussion takes place um but if you have any question related to that please don't uh, hesitate to interrupt me and uh, and ask questions um also i must say that my internet connection is not always perfect so um, sometimes i just freeze for a few seconds if it happens of course i can't see it um but please uh, don't hesitate to uh, stop me and and ask me to uh, to repeat or um, or to say or i mean to to go over something which uh, maybe was not clear enough so uh, this is uh, to begin with a sketch of uh, the evolution of the universe as we understand it uh, today we know that the universe is populated with a variety of different objects from planets to stars to galaxies clusters of galaxies and so on and the way that we understand the formation of these objects throughout the history of the universe is that we started from some tiny density fluctuations in the plasma of the universe and that these fluctuations evolved under the action of gravity to form the structure and the large scale structure of the universe that we observe um, today now the question is of course how those tiny fluctuations formed in the first place and the way that we understand them today is that we think the universe underwent a period of accelerated expansion at early time which is called inflation and during this period tiny quantum fluctuations in the vacuum state of the universe were amplified by gravitational instability and gave rise to classical um, density perturbations so the way that this mechanism proceeds in practice is in fact uh, uh, um, i mean a, a very common mechanism from the perspective of quantum mechanics um, and it proceeds as follows schematically So this here is um, the metric which describes an expanding universe an expanding universe is defined only by a single function of time which is called the scale factor a of t so if you wish a of t is a measure of, of the size of the universe as some instant in time uh, t gives a typical time scale or a typical length scale uh, which characterizes the curvature of space time so because space time is expanding it has a curvature and the typical length scale which characterizes the curvature is given by this inverse um, hubble parameter now if on top of this expanding background one considers um, um, uh, a quantum field and if one expands this quantum field into fourier modes then the dynamics of each fourier mode very much depends on whether the wavelengths associated associated to that mode which here i denote lambda is smaller or larger than the hubble radius so if the wavelength is smaller than the hubble radius what happens is that locally the physics of that mode is insensitive to space time curvature because it because it doesn't see the effect of the curvature so if you wish it's exactly the same as when you perform a physics experiment um in your classroom or um or, or in the lab you don't need to take into account um the effect of the curvature of of the earth that the earth is a sphere just because you're you're doing experiments at length scales which are much smaller than the uh, radius of the earth on the other hand if the wavelength is of the same order or even larger than the curvature 
then you feel the effect of the uh, of, of, of the curvature of space time so if you carry out experiments between um, I don't know New York and uh, and Delhi um, then obviously the distance between those two cities is of the same order as the radius of the earth and so you do have to take into account the fact that uh, if you send signals um, uh, along the surface of the earth then you're sending signals along a curved um, surface and not something which is flat um, and so what happens in the, in, in the early universe, and in particular during inflation, is that you have a transition between these two regimes here. So you start in this regime where you don't feel the effect of the curvature, and you end up in this regime where you do feel the effect of the curvature of space-time. So more precisely, this is a sketch of uh, the time evolution of the Hubble radius, so this uh, um, sort of uh, pink uh, line here as a function of time. So here time is measured in terms of uh, the log of the scale factor. Um, so as the universe expands, you go from the left to the right on this plot. And you can see that uh, during the uh, history of the universe, the Hubble radius increases. There is this phase of inflation where it's almost a constant and then it increases during a, an epoch dominated by radiation then by uh, matter, pressureless matter, and more recently by some sort of dark energy. So you see that if now you consider a Fourier mode of a given quantum field on this expanding background, the wavelengths associated to that mode just grows as an effect of the expansion, so lambda is just proportional to A, in such a way that during inflation, initially, you start out the evolution in a regime where lambda is smaller than the Hubble radius. And what happens there is that well, nothing happens. You have just a, a quantum field in the vacuum state on top of something which looks like a flat background, a Minkowski background, so there is nothing going on. The field just remains in the vacuum state. But as soon as it crosses out the Hubble radius, it feels the effect of the expansion of, 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 of space, so it feels the effect of the curvature of, of space-time. And whenever you put a quantum field on top of a curved background, what you typically have is particle production, which is the quantum mechanism. It's the same mechanism as around the black hole that would give rise to Hawking radiation, for instance. So in this regime here, um, you have quantum particle production, which gives rise to classical density fluctuations on very large scales. So the expansion stretches those um, fluctuations to very large distances. And later on, those fluctuations evolve and give rise to everything we observe in the universe. So one object, for instance, which is of particular interest um, to probe those uh, primordial fluctuations in the is the cosmic microwave background. So the cosmic microwave background is the radiation we observe from the moment that the universe became transparent to the propagation of light. This is a, a nice image taken by the Planck satellite in 2015 which was updated in 2018, of the temperature fluctuations of, of this background. So you have tiny temperature fluctuations of the order of uh, 10 to the minus 5 in relative amplitude. This is only the, uh, the fluctuations that you see, not the uh, background mean value. Um, this is just to give you an idea of uh, how well the accuracy of the data has improved in the past decades or so. This is uh, the map taken by Kobe in 1992, W map in 2003, and, and, and then Planck um, a decade ago. So you see how the angular resolution and um, accuracy of the measurement has improved in time. So the way that we understand um, this and, 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 and that we use the cosmic microwave background to better probe the physics of inflation is that on top of the uh, expanding homogeneous background, we uh, introduce um, um, fluctuations, um, perturbations. And as it turns out, there is a single combination um, of the fluctuations in the metric components and of the matter content which uh, is gauge invariant. Here by gauge invariant, I mean invariant under change of coordinates. Uh, we know that uh, because of general relativity, any physical quantity should be uh, independent of the uh, coordinate choice. So there is a single such combination as far as scalar fluctuations are concerned. This is denoted by this uh, letter V here. And this V here is directly proportional to the uh, anisotropy in the temperature, which is measured on the CMB, on the cosmic microwave background. So what we do is we treat this uh, fluctuation uh, field as a quantum field, um, which uh, here is stressed by the hat notation, starting out in a vacuum state, which is called the Bunch-Davis state. So we, we set this field in a state which contains zero particle at early time. 
And what we see is that as soon as the field crosses out, as soon as the wavelength of the field crosses out, the Hubble radius it undergoes quantum amplification. And this gives rise to some um, 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 classical fluctuations, so classical anisotropies in the temperature field. Now, this plot here is just a comparison of what you, what you obtain when you do this calculation. So when you solve the Schrodinger equation for this quantum, uh, for, for those quantum modes, this is the red line here. So this is the prediction of this calculation for the uh, temperature and isotropy. What is displayed here is the, if you wish, it's a power spectrum, but in, on, on a sphere, because we measure the cosmic microwave background on a sphere. So it's like, uh, it's a bit like Fourier moments, but they're called multiple moments on the sphere. Um, so this, the large wave, the large wavelengths correspond to this to small values of this parameter L, and the small wavelengths correspond to large values of L. The red line is the prediction for the from the calculation, and the blue dots are observed uh, values of the uh, of, of, of the multiple moments by the Planck satellite. And you see how well uh, those two agree. Uh, so this is for the temperature on the sorry on the right hand side. You have the same thing for the correlation between the temperature and uh, some uh, polarization of the photons, because we don't only measure the temperature of the photons, we also measure their polarization. This is the same for just the polarization, polarization um, uh, correlation. And you see that in any channel you look at, um, which um, uh, may mix temperature and polarization, you still get the exquisite agreement between the theoretical predictions and the measured um, and the measurements from Planck. So this confirms pretty well this setup of inflation and, uh, and this quantum calculation. Now, the thing is, by looking at the cosmic microwave background, what you actually do is you constrain um, um, perturbations in a certain range of scales, um, which is finite because the angular resolution of the experiment is finite. And in turns, it means that you are probing scales which cross out the Hubble radius at a certain time frame during inflation, which here is uh, represented by this uh, square here. And you see that across the entire um, uh, evolution during inflation, the, the time window that we see, that we do see through the cosmic background, background is actually pretty narrow. We only see a small, small portion of it, and anything which happens either before that or even after that is very poorly constrained. So this might improve um, um, a little bit if you um, consider measurements of the large scale structure, which, um, which forms from those fluctuations, but after the cosmic microwave background, there you, you access slightly smaller scales, so you can um, uh, indirectly get some information about uh, another time window, which is uh, represented here, which is still pretty narrow and not as accurate as what you could get from the CMB. And there are some prospects of improving this uh, state of affairs slightly. For instance, if you measure spectral distortions, so those are deviations from the black body spectrum of the cosmic microwave background. So far, the cosmic microwave background is found to have a perfect black body spectrum. Um, but uh, there could be some small deviations. And in the future, if we measure those deviations, we could in principle, access slightly smaller scales. And then there are some future experiments of the large scale structure, like the SKA, the square array, um, um, the square kilometer array telescope that you might have heard of, which could also slightly um, increase the range of scales being probed and, uh, and so enlarge the, the time lapse during inflation, where we do get some information about the physical dynamics. But even if you take those futuristic experiments into account, you still have access to only some region of the, uh, uh, of the evolution of the early universe, and you're still lacking some information about, for instance, what happens in this region. Now, this has led uh, cosmologists uh, to speculate that because we don't constrain um, the physics of this um, of these last um, E fold, so E fold is just uh, the name for this um, capital N variable, the log of the scale factor. So, because we don't constrain much the physics of the last E fold of inflation, it could be that something gives rise to large fluctuations, much larger than the ones we see in the cosmic microwave background. In the cosmic microwave background, we see that the primordial fluctuations are very small, but maybe they are large at some smaller scales. And if this happens, it could be that those large fluctuations could directly collapse and form primordial black holes. So primordial black holes are like astrophysical black holes. The main difference is that astrophysical black holes form 
from the collapse of the um, of a star, typically, so a dying star which is sufficiently heavy may collapse and form a black hole when it dies. Primordial black holes form at a time when there is no stars and, and nothing like that in the universe. They form at a very early time from the direct collapse of uh, those primordial density fluctuations. So this is like this could be thought of as a, somehow an exotic scenario, um, just a possibility offered by, by inflation, but, uh, but slightly exotic. However, there are some indications or some reasons to consider primordial black holes as being an interesting object for cosmology. One of the main reasons is that it could play a role in the dark matter. So, so far we don't know what dark matter is and primordial black holes is, is a good candidate because, well, by definition, they are dark. Um, they don't interact with uh, other objects um, other than through gravitation. They don't emit light. Um, so, they are, they, I mean, they, they could constitute a um, fraction of dark matter or maybe even all of the dark matter we see. Um, another reason is that um, they could also explain um, uh, the observation of many um, gravitational wave events. Um, so, you may know that uh, LIGO and Virgo uh, detect. Um, have detected various uh, mergers of uh, black holes um, through the emission of gravitational waves. And the question is, of course, where, does the black, where, does, uh, uh, where do these black holes uh, come from? And um, of course, they could be coming from astrophysical um, origins, but um, there are some indications or some reasons to consider that they could be also a population of, of primordial black holes being observed in these merging events. It could also provide seeds for the structure. So if primordial black holes exist very early on in the universe, they will accelerate um, structure formation through gravitational effects. And this may help to resolve some tensions that uh, are currently ongoing in, in, in structure formation. And finally, uh, the last motivation I wanted to mention is that uh, primordial black holes could explain solar masses, um, and it's hard to explain the existence of such supermassive black holes from astrophysical processes. The typical scenario is that you start from a, a black hole um, um, of a few solar masses, and then that this black hole uh, merges uh, uh, with other black holes or creates matter. But even if you, if, even if you take this into account, it's, it's pretty hard to reach uh, those super high masses, um, while primordial black holes can have any mass, as I will explain in a second. And therefore, they could uh, uh, explain the existence of those uh, supermassive black holes. So the goal of my presentation is to explain that um, primordial black holes require large primordial density fluctuations. And uh, there are many works to try to uh, come up with mechanisms during inflation that would produce those, those large fluctuations. Those mechanisms are most of the time pretty fine-tuned. Um, they require to fine-tune the microphysical parameters that describe inflation to a very large extent. And what I'm going to argue is that, in fact, uh, there is an inevitable mechanism which happens immediately after inflation, which is called preheating, which already provides a way to form primordial black holes, um, at least primordial black holes with a very small mass. So those primordial black holes, they may not explain the supermassive black holes at the center of the galaxies, but they could um, uh, play uh, some other role. I should also mention that uh, the results that I'm going to show are taken from these uh, four papers mostly, and they have been obtained in collaboration with, uh, uh, with a few people here in Paris uh, who, are listed, uh, who are listed here. So let's get started and uh, let me introduce a little bit uh, metric preheating, which is the main mechanism at the heart of, uh, the, of the PBH formation. So this is a sketch of a uh, possible potential for inflation. Um, so inflation, we think, is realized by a scalar field, phi, which we call the inflaton, and which just evolves um, uh, along a certain potential. Oops, sorry. So this is a possible uh, potential for inflation, and uh, you see that if I just uh, let the field start from some initial condition here, what happens is that it slowly rolls down the potential. Um, in the phase where it slowly rolls down the potential, there is inflation, and then at some point it... Uh, it reaches the vicinity of the minimum of the potential and it starts to oscillate around the minimum. So in this uh, scenario, there are two phases, one which is called uh, inflation. So during inflation, the, uh, um, 
the uh, uh, field is uh, dri is mostly driven by the sorry I don't know if you see that annoying playing bar or maybe it's only me anyway. Um, so yeah, during that epoch, the field is mostly driven by the slope of the potential. And then at some point, the potential becomes too steep uh, for inflation to proceed. So inflation stops and you have this phase of preheating where the in inflaton just oscillates at the bottom of its potential. And I will comment um, uh, mostly on, on that preheating phase. So in order to describe what happens there, it's useful to introduce the equation of state parameter, which is just a ratio between the pressure and the energy density. Uh, which are supported by that, by that field. And one can show that uh, the pressure here is just given by the difference between the kinetic energy of the field and the potential energy, while the energy density is given by the sum of this uh, kinetic energy plus potential energy. So this is a plot of what happens for the uh, equation of state parameter in this scenario. So during inflation at early time, this W parameter is almost minus one. And the reason is when the field slowly, slowly rolls down the potential, the kinetic energy is very small because the, the velocity of the field is tiny. So this kinetic term here vanishes and you get W equals minus one or almost minus one. And then when you enter this preheating phase, you can see that W oscillates uh, with a pretty large amplitude. It oscillates between minus one and plus one. So the average value of W equals to zero. And, um, and uh, you see that if uh, a mean W equals to zero, I mean, when W equals to zero, it means that the pressure equals zero. And this is why people sometimes describe this phase as being equivalent to having a pressureless uh, fluid. But in fact, it's only an approximation at the background level, which means only when you average over different oscillations, because what actually happens is that W oscillates between pretty large values and vanishes only on average. The reason is you don't have a pressureless fluid. What you actually have is a scalar field, and the scalar field is different from a, from a fluid. Now, one can, um, on top of this homogeneous um, uh, field, one can introduce uh, fluctuations, as I, as I was uh, saying before. The fluctuations can be described with this variable v, which I've already introduced. And the equation of motion for the uh, Fourier mode of this uh, v variable is given by this expression. So here you recognize the wave number, k, the scale factor that I have already introduced, and w, um, and w appears in this equation, which is the reason why I've displayed it here. Um, so what happens is that um, um, during the preheating phase, this equation can be written in a, in, in a, in a, in a different way. Um, so you see that uh, because W oscillates, um, uh, this uh, way of writing um, that equation of motion has an uh, oscillating function. And, and this cosine function here just comes from the oscillation of the uh, equation of state parameter. Uh, here, I've just uh, written the equation in terms of um, these two quantities, A, K, and Q. So A, K is given by this expression. Q is given by this expression. K is the wave number, as I said before. M is the mass of the field um, close to the uh, minimum. So if you wish, it's, uh, it's V double prime. It's the curvature of the potential around its minimum. And Q is, is given by this expression. Phi N is the value of the field at the end of inflation. So when you start, so if you wish, it's, it's this value of phi. So when you start the preheating phase. And uh, A N is just the value of the scale factor at that time. MPL is the Planck mass. So it's the inverse Newton constant. And uh, tau here is just a redefinition of time, where I just multiply time by, uh, by n. So the reason why I put this equation in this, uh, in this other form is that this, has a, this, this is a known equation in, in, mathem in, in mathematical analysis, and this is called the Mathieu equation. But the Mathieu, sorry, let me just go back to the equation again. The Mathieu equation is in fact not exactly that. The Mathieu equation is that equation when you assume that those parameters A and Q are uh, constant in time. Here, you see that they are not constant in time. And the reason is that the scale factor increases because of the expansion. So A and Q are not constant in time. And this is not exactly a Mathieu equation. But still, you can get some insight about the solutions of this equation by looking at, at the Mathieu equation first. So this is the Mathieu equation. And uh, by doing something which is called Floquet analysis, one can show that asymptotically, the solutions of this equation approach uh, that behavior. 
Um, so namely, they are given by a function which is periodic in time, so just some oscillating function, times exponential of um, uk times uh, tau. Okay, so there is some exponential behavior uh, here. And this mu k parameter, which is called the Floquet exponent, is displayed here as a function of the two parameters of the matter equation, namely a and q. So you can see that you have different regions in the, in the dark black regions, um, the Floquet exponent vanishes, which means that um, here this exponential term is just one and you just get a periodic function. So in the dark blue region, you just have a periodic solution. But you see that you have some bands here inside of which the uh, Floquet exponent is strictly positive, which means that you have uh, run away in your solution. So the solution is given by some periodic function, finds the function which, um, which uh, blows up, which diverges in time. So if you end up being in one of those regions here, what it means is that the amplitude of your fluctuations will increase. And this is at the basis of, uh, of the metric preceding mechanism. This is what will give rise to Kramoto black holes eventually. So more precisely, one should be looking at what happens in practice. So as I said, A and Q are not constant in time now. They are, in fact, uh, uh, functions of time. So it means that at a given wavelength, what happens is that uh, one evolves along one of these lines. So you see, here I've just taken these formulas for A and Q. Um, as a function of time, um, A changes, Q changes, and it happens along that line. You see that as a function, when A increases, so when the universe expands, A approaches one and Q approaches zero, which means that you go from this uh, location on the line, and then you go down the line until this place here. You can also see that uh, the smaller uh, K, which means the larger the wavelengths, uh, then the smaller A. So uh, lambda one here is a smaller wavelength than lambda two, which is a smaller wavelength than lambda three. Eventually, what will happen is that uh, as time proceeds, you go uh, closer and closer to this region. And this region here is a region where, this is just a zoom here, is a region where the instability uh, band is pretty narrow. And for this reason, it is called the narrow resonance regime. So you have two regimes, you have the broad resonance regime and the narrow resonance regime. This is the narrow resonance regime. And if you really zoom in this uh, tiny region here, you can show that the structure of the band is given by this expression, so that the region where mu is not zero is given by this inequality here. A should be between one minus Q and one plus Q. And you can also compute the value of the mu K exponent, and it's just given by Q over two. Um, again, this is what happens when you increase lambda. So you can see that if you want to lie inside this instability band, um, Lambda needs to be large enough. So if lambda equals to that value, you, you do not enter the instability band. But as you increase lambda, you end up inside the instability band. So what this condition gives you here is really a lower bound for the wavelengths, or equivalently an upper bound for the wave number. And when you work out, I mean, when you replace those expressions by what they are, what you find is that the wave number should be less than uh, a times square root of hm, or the wavelengths should be larger than um, inverse of the uh, square root of hm. And uh, okay, so this gives you a range of scales for which you will have some amplification. And now what is the uh, rate at which um, uh, this amplification takes place? Well, you have to look at the Floquet exponent. And again, when you replace those expressions and you put them back in the equation, what you find is that inside the instability band, the uh, v variable um, uh, increases like the scale factor. So for those of you who are maybe more expert in cosmological perturbation theory, what this means here is that the curvature fluctuation, the curvature fluctuation is conserved, um, and um, which is of course expected at the large scales. But as you will see, this condition here also means that it, it, it is valid at, at smaller scales. So this remark is, is more for experts, but just to connect with the things that you may have already heard about. But let me just keep this because it's somehow technical and to, so this is what happens. So here you have a similar plot as uh, what you had, uh, what I showed before. So this is the Hubble radius. The green line is the Hub sorry, the blue line is the Hubble radius as a function of time. During inflation, it's almost a constant, and during preheating, it it increases. And the green line here is the new scale of the problem, this uh, square root of uh, n h, which uh, we had before. The gray lines are just um, uh, wavelengths of different modes of different value of k. Now, what happens is that uh, 
um, if, if you lie inside this region, so below the green line, um, then uh, you're, you're outside of the instability band. So the wavelength is too small um, to be inside the instability band and you get no amplification. So nothing uh, interesting happens here. While if you're above this green line, uh, the uh, V variable grows like A. Um, so above the blue line, it just means that the curvature uh, perturbation is a constant. And um, because you're outside of the Hubble radius, However, inside the Hubble radius, so if you're between the green line and the blue line, what happens here is that the density contrast, so delta here is the uh, density contrast, so it's the uh, ratio between the fluctuation in the, uh, in the density fields divided by the mean value of the density field. This density contrast here increases like the scale factor, and this is really some, some actual instability. There is some amplification of the uh, density fluctuation in the plasma here which will give rise to supramodal records. So the idea is that there is a range of scales for which, uh, which is called the instability band for which the uh, amplitude of the fluctuations uh, increases. A small re remark again for uh, those of you who may be uh, expert of this, uh, which is that uh, this phase has been studied in, in, in a variety of papers, assuming that things behave as pressureless matter, so as if the universe was full of a perfect fluid with vanishing pressure. And um, what I've already um, uh, mentioned before, that this is not the case here because we have a, a scalar field instead, and the two things are not exactly the same. They match on average, but not when you resolve the fluctuations, the oscillations, sorry. But because the oscillations are precisely the origins of the instability, it means that the conclusion you draw from this analysis are very much different from the conclusions you would have drawn by just studying the pressure of fluid. So you really have to pay attention to the fact that the system under consideration here is a scalar field oscillating at the bottom of its potential and not just a pressureless fluid. So let me just skip that as well. So we have a few technical slides, but um, I, I'm not going to discuss them just because I want to jump to the result uh, more quickly. So now the question is, once you have identified a range of scales inside which um, there is some uh, ongoing amplifications, the density contrast grows like the scale factor, the question is, um, how likely is it um, to form a black hole, a primordial black hole? So for that, you can do some calculation, which is called um, what is called a spherical collapse model. So you look at some local um, uh, density peak in your uh, density uh, fluid. So you assume that the scalar field um, uh, has a spherical, uh, uh, spherical configuration. So the value of the field only depends on some radial coordinate r on top of time t, of course. And you put this uh, spherical, um, uh, spherically uh, uh, distributed field inside a metric which also has this spherical symmetry. So you see this metric here is the, the generic metric um, in which um, uh, the components only depend on the uh, radial distance r. Um, so you have the metric, you have the stress energy tensor, which is generated by the scalar field. So you can write down Einstein equations. And uh, when you solve those Einstein equations, um, what you find is that uh, the homogeneity, uh, so the, the, the small peak in your density field, will indeed collapse and form a black hole after some time. And the time which is given for this to, to happen is given by this expression. Uh, so TBC here denotes the band crossing time. So it's the time at which the typical scale of the black hole, the length scale of the black hole enters the instability band. H is the value of the Hubble parameter. And delta um, is um, the value of the density fluctuation at that time. So you see that if you start from a very small density fluctuation, if delta R is very small, then you need a long time to form a black hole. But if delta R is, is, is very large, so you have already a large density fluctuation, then you need a much smaller time. So this makes uh, perfect sense. Um, um, okay, let me just skip this remark as well. So what happens here is the following. So consider that I have um, this instability band. And uh, obviously, this instability doesn't last forever. Because at some point, the inflaton just decays into standard model particles. This is called reheating, which is different from preheating. Um, and this, we will think, we will assume happens at a certain time. 
uh, when the Hubble parameter equals uh, some decay rate, which, has called, which I call gamma in a very generic way. So there is a time which I will denote T gamma or H gamma at which uh, the inflaton decays and, and this instability, which is triggered by the oscillations of the inflaton at the bottom of its potential, this instability stops. So the instability lasts between the end of inflation and this uh, time, which I call T gamma. So now if I look at a certain scale, which is uh, now displayed with this uh, solid uh, gray line, um, that scale enters the instability at some time, which is called the bend crossing time, and, and, and stops uh, when well, the instability stops at this time, which I call T gamma. So what it means is that um, for a promoter black hole to form at that scale, I need the time inside the instability band, which is just given by T gamma minus T band crossing, so the amount of time between these two points, I need it to be larger than the time that it takes for a black hole to form, which was given from the previous slide. And because this time, remember, increases when the density contrast decreases, it means that this condition puts, uh, uh, puts a, a lower bound on the value of the density contrast, right? So only if the density contrast is large enough and the time that it needs to form a black hole is, is small enough and it can be smaller than the available time that I have inside the instability then. So this is the reason why you have a lower bound on the density contrast and this lower bound, I can compute it and it's given by, by um, basically this expression. So it depends on the scale at which um, I consider the black hole and then it depends on the value of uh, uh, the Hubble parameter at the end of inflation and the one at the end of the instability phase. So now uh, we have a criterion for when do black holes uh, form. So just a, a small remark, which is that, uh, well, no, maybe I will get to that uh, later on. Just remember that um, now we can tell whether a promoter fluctuation at the end of inflation will end up inside a black hole or not. Another question is the following. I have uh, some density field at the end of inflation. So this is just a plot of my density contrast as a function of some spatial coordinate here I just display one uh, uh, spatial dimension for simplicity, but you should um, uh, picture that this is in fact a three-dimensional field. So this is my density contrast field at the end of inflation. I know that there is a value above which um, a certain fluctuation will uh, form a black hole. And the question is, well, if, if, if I give you this, can you tell me whether there will be a black hole or not? And if there is a black hole, can you tell me what the size of the black hole is going to be? So what's the mass inside the black hole will be, so on and so forth. And the way that we solve this problem is by using something which is called the excursion set uh, formalism, which I'm just going to explain in, in maybe one or, one or two slides. And the way it works is as follows. So the first thing you do is that you average the value of the density field over a certain region in space. So starting from your... Uh, from a certain point in space, which is uh, denoted X, what you do is you configure a region of size R, capital R, around that point, and you average the value of the field inside that region. So W here is just a window function which selects point inside uh, this uh, R region. And if you do that, if your point of interest X is just the origins of this axis, if you average the density field on a region of size r, this is what you obtain as a function of r. Okay, so you see that as r increases, uh, the average density field uh, has some evolution. This is just a schematic example that's just drawn a random, random function and, uh, and, and, and did this uh, simple averaging procedure. Now, the question is, you know that there is a value for the density contrast above which um, um, the system above which the space will end up in a black hole and below which uh, space will just continue its uh, standard evolution. And you see that as R decreases, there are two um, values uh, for which you cross the critical threshold. There is one which is denoted by this blue, by, sorry, by this yellow point here, which is called R2, which corresponds to that lens here. And then there is another one which is uh, denoted by this uh, pink uh, circle and which corresponds to this uh, second size here. So you see, so if you average the density contrast over this region, over this region, what you find is that you, uh, uh, well, that, that you are at the critical value. So now the question is what will happen in practice for that region in space? Um, 
Well, first of all, you know that there will be a black hole because there are uh, regions uh, where the uh, average density contrast is above the critical threshold. So you know for sure that there will be a black hole. Now the question is, what is the size of the black hole? But in fact, what will happen is that this scale here, R1, because it's, small, it's a smaller distance, it will first um, form a black hole. But then afterwards, there will be a second black hole, if you wish, which will be slightly larger, which will also form. So at the end of the day, this big black hole will eat up, if you wish, this smaller black hole. So what you will see as an external observer is only a big black hole of size R2. So the size of the resulting primordial black hole is the largest value of R, which uh, crosses the threshold. And this mechanism where you have several trussings and uh, smaller black holes end up in bigger black holes is, is called the cloud in cloud um, mechanism. So this is what you need to do, okay? You, this is your procedure. You have a density field, you average it over space, and then you look at the largest value of the uh, size of the averaging region for which uh, you cross the threshold. Okay, now on the technical level, how do you compute this uh, uh, value R2? So again, very schematically, the way it proceeds is the following. So when you average a function over a region of size R, if you write down this average uh, function in Fourier space, what you find is that um, averaging over R, in fact, simply amounts to keeping modes which are larger than R, so wave numbers which are smaller than one over R. Now, this expression allows you to write down a differential equation for the average density contrast as a function of r. And uh, because the right-hand side of this expression only depends on r for the lower bound of the integral, what you find is that uh, when you differentiate it with respect to r, the right-hand side is given by the amplitude of the, of the mode function. Um, and the amplitude of the mode function is just given by some square root of the power spectrum times a random noise because the uh, actual realization of this uh, mode function is just a random it's just a random process, right? It's, it's a quantum field, so it's like quantum mechanics. If you measure things, you get a random answer. What you know is, is the dispersion of this random answer that's given by the uh, uh, two-point functions or the power spectrum, but then the, the actual realization is a, random, uh, is a random answer. So when you solve, so this uh, differential equation is a stochastic differential equation. It's called a Langevin equation because there is a random noise on the right-hand side. And when you solve uh, realizations of it, you typically get something like that. So you see, you start starting from very large values of R. So if you average the field over uh, an infinitely large region, there is no, by definition, there is no fluctuation because you just reach the uh, average value. So when R goes to infinity, delta um, goes to zero. And then on, as R decreases, you solve this uh, differential equation and, and you get some stochastic realizations. So now the question is, which of those realizations cross the threshold and what is the size associated to, to the black hole that will form? And you see that you have different answers depending on the realization. For instance, this orange realization never crosses the black hole. So that one will never form a black hole. There is no black hole. Um, uh, now the green, um, sorry, the blue region crosses the threshold only once at that location. So you will have a black hole, the size of which is given by this value R here. And the grid realization crosses the threshold two times. In fact, uh, let me see one, two, even three times. Um, but as we said before, the size of the resulting black hole is the largest value of R. So it's given by, by this value of uh, R here. Um, FPT here means uh, first passage time. So it means that in practice, what we have to do is solve a first passage time crossing problem for this uh, stochastic differential equation. And we have techniques for doing that. So given this stochastic equations, there are techniques to extract the distribution of the first crossing time of a certain uh, threshold value. So in that way, we can compute the distribution function associated to the first crossing time. And the mass distribution of the black hole, which is called beta, beta of m, is just given by this, uh, first, by this distribution of the first crossing time. Okay, so this was, of course, it's a very schematic uh, summary of, uh, of this approach, which uh, has many interesting uh, technical aspects, but just to give you some, some rough idea about uh, the way it works. And when you carry out the calculation, this is what you obtain for the mass function. So the mass function is just the number of black holes with a certain mass n as a function of the mass. So this is being done for some uh, values of, of the parameters of the problem. 
you see that um, uh, for those values, for instance, most of the black hole that we find have a mass of the order of 10 to the, well, 10 to the 7, 10 to the, 10 to the 8 grams. You have different curves here. The different curves just correspond to uh, various techniques to solve the first passage time problem and various approximations. Um, uh, but uh, well, the difference between those results is, is negligible anyway. So you see that the mass function peaks at a certain mass. And, um, and, and in that way, we can compute uh, how many black holes we have at each mass, at each particular mass. Now, something you can do is compute what is called the integrated mass function, which is the integral of this uh, beta function across all masses. The result of this integral is called omega PBH, and omega PBH is really the fraction of the universe which is contained inside black holes, right? So if you look at all the mass and energy inside the universe, how much of it uh, is inside primordial black holes and, and how much of it is outside primordial black holes. This is given by this number omega. Omega is comprised between zero and one. And here I've displayed omega as a function of this quantity, which is the ratio between uh, the energy at the end of the instability scale and the energy at the end of inflation. So when the instability lasts uh, for, uh, I mean, when there is no instability, when the instability is, is really short, rho gamma equals rho end. So this parameter here is one. So you end up on the left-hand side of this plot. And so if there is no instability, well, it's not a surprise that you find that omega is zero. So there is no black holes. But as the duration of the instability increases, what you find is that omega increases. In fact, it starts to increase very sharply at some point and very quickly reaches one. So when it reaches one, it's an extreme result. And I will come back to it, to it in a second because it means that uh, the entire universe is inside primordial black holes. Of course, this is not, I will maybe, I don't know if I will have time, but I will explain that this is not allowed. Um, um, even if uh, those black holes later on evaporate, Hawking evaporate, this is not allowed, but you see that you have a transition between those two regimes, which is very uh, abrupt. Uh, so just checking on time quickly. Um, so here is, this, is, a, is, yeah, is a nice plot which uh, explores a parameter space. So the previous plot was just for a given value of uh, rho end and rho gamma. Here is what happens when you let those two things vary. Um, the gray region is uh, irrelevant because uh, obviously rho gamma cannot be larger than rho end. Inflation ends before the end of the uh, preheating phase. So only the upper left triangle is the relevant region. And what you see is that there is um, this uh, dark uh, red uh, triangle inside of which uh, the amount of uh, primordial black holes is so large that the entire universe is contained inside primordial black holes. So this, we managed to find some analytical expression for the boundary, and, um, and it tells you basically that uh, there is a bound on the uh, reheating, temp what is called the reheating temperature, so the point at which the inflaton decays into standard model particles. There is a band on this parameter uh, such that um, primordial black holes dominate the content of the universe or not. So those are plots about the masses of the black hole. Um, the masses of the typical black holes which are being formed. But the only thing I want to commend is that you see that there is a region inside this uh, upper left triangle where the um, uh, typical mass of the black hole is very, very small. So this is the mass in gram. And in fact, it can be even smaller than 10 to the 9 gram. And 10 to the 9 gram is a very small mass for a black hole because it means that um, the time it takes to Hawking evaporate is so short that it will Hawking evaporate before Big Bang nucleosynthesis, so before the first elements in the universe form. And because we have no constraints whatsoever on the uh, abundance of black holes before that time, it means that, uh, well, uh, the amount of black holes can be arbitrarily, I mean, can be very large at those masses. It does not matter because they will all evaporate before BBN, and so we don't see them anyway. So we cannot really exclude, at least, I mean, doing that, uh, we cannot really exclude the possibility to have a domination by very light primordial black holes very early on, as long as they evaporate before Big Bang nucleosynthesis. But this is the case in, in this, roughly in this region here, because the masses are, are so small. Um, so, yeah, maybe one last, I mean, a couple of last things, and then I will um, uh, move on uh, towards my conclusions. So I've just mentioned Hawking evaporation. So you may know that um, 
black holes um, uh, evaporate uh, through Hawking radiation. Hawking radiation is a mechanism which is similar to the one I was mentioning before for inflation, which is such that uh, the mass of a black hole um, slightly decreases as it emits uh, particles. Um, and the time it takes for a black hole to evaporate is uh, to entirely evaporate is given by this expression. So you see that it's not a surprise that a very large black hole takes a long, a long time, very long time to evaporate. And, just, and a very light black hole takes a very little time to evaporate because it goes as a cubic power of the mass. And uh, more precisely, this is the way that the mass of a black hole evolves in time. Um, so what you have to do uh, if you want to evolve the mass distribution is take this Hawking evaporation into account and also take into account, uh, so this is what happens here for omega. So omega is the integral of the mass function, but uh, uh, at each mass you get this uh, uh, decrease uh, parameter. And uh, beta here, beta bar, is um, uh, also takes into account the volume dilution. So volume dilution has to do with the fact that when you have a universe uh, filled uh, with um, radiation and primordial black holes, the density of those two components does not uh, evolve in the same way. So primordial black holes, the, density, the energy density of primordial black holes just decays as one over the volume of the universe. If you expand the universe, to, I mean, the number density just decreases as one over the volume. So, so it goes like one over A cubed, but radiation decays as one over A fourth. Um, because uh, well, because the well, because the temperature of photons also get an, an additional one over a um, because of redshift. So it means that uh, if you have now a mixture of primordial black holes and radiation, um, the way that uh, the energy density of uh, uh, primordial black holes evolves will, uh, will 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 be different than is given by this equation. So when you solve these two equations, this is what you obtain for the time evolution of uh, this omega PBH parameter. So this is what happens from the end of the instability phase. The small circle is the end of the instability phase as a function of time. So here, because the energy density decays in an expanding universe, time flows from the right to the left of this uh, plot. So you really have to read this plot from the right to the left. And the different curves, they correspond to different values of uh, uh, rho gamma, so different durations of the instability phase. Which, course, which give different initial abundance of primordial black holes. So let us first look at the blue line, for instance, here. So here, you start the evolution after metric preheating in a stage where you have uh, few primordial black holes. And at the beginning, what happens is that the density of primordial black hole increases. And the reason why it increases is, is this redshift effect. So it decays at 1 over a cubed. The radiation decays at 1 over a fourth. So when you compare primordial black holes to radiation, in fact, it increased as the scale factor. So there is this increase. And then at some point, Hawking, Hawking evaporation takes place. And uh, very abruptly, uh, all those black holes evaporate around that time. And, uh, and so the, inner, the, the, um, the density parameter of primordial black holes decays very quickly. So when you reach the time of, of uh, BBN, of uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, there is no primordial black holes left. Uh, the same will happen in this curve here. And then you can look at those other curves, which are also interesting. So for instance, that one, so that one has the same sort of scenario. The only difference is that before Hawking evaporation kicks in, you see that because of this redshifting effect, the uh, density of uh, primordial black holes reaches one. So what happens is, is in this scenario is, is pretty interesting. You start the evolution in a state where there is uh, uh, much less primordial black holes than radiation. Then because of the effect of, uh, of volume dilution, you reach a stage where primordial black holes actually dominate over radiation and the universe is mostly containing primordial black holes. It's, in fact, it's just full of primordial black holes. And then those primordial black holes, they Hawking evaporate. So they fill the entire universe with radiation, the radiation from Hawking evaporation. So you have a radiation phase afterwards, but the universe has undergone a phase during which it was uh, dominated by uh, primordial black holes. And this is a very strong conclusion because it changes the cosmological model in a non-trivial way by introducing a new phase in the cosmic history where the universe was dominated by uh, primordial black holes. Because it happens so early in time before Big Bang nucleosynthesis, it does not contradict observations that we have because we don't really observe that epoch. 
it still delivers a universe which is full of radiation before BBN. So it's it's so it, it I mean it works in the sense that this is the only requirement that we that we need to have. But still, there is this very non-trivial aspect of the universe field just dominated by primordial black holes at some time. Now. Um, yeah, so what, what happens here is that the reheating of the universe proceeds from a PBH evaporation. And before I stop, I just wanted to very quickly mention, mention um, I mean, may, maybe in two minutes, just mention a last result that allows you to better understand what could happen during this phase where the universe is, is dominated by promodal black holes. And the way we have approached this is by studying the amount of gravitational waves that would be emitted from such a universe. So the idea is the following, there is a phase where the universe is just full of primordial black holes that are randomly distributed, as in those uh, blue dots here. So although those primordial black holes will disappear at some point, uh, during this epoch, they generate some density fluctuation, just, okay, you don't have the same density at, at every point in space because you have these black holes which are randomly distributed. And in fact, what you can show in, in, in cosmological perturbation theory is that because of gravitational interaction, when you have density fluctuations like this, those density fluctuations, they will couple to tensor fluctuations, that is to gravitational waves. So you have a coupling between gravitational waves and between um, scalar fluctuations and between density fluctuations. And this coupling is such that if you have large density fluctuations, you can produce gravitational waves. So some sort of primordial gravitation wave, if you wish. So you can carry out this calculation. And because I don't have time, I just skip all the technical things about this calculation. I just want to show you some final results. Um, so, okay, so here we, we could compute the spectrum of those gravitation waves or the amount of gravitation waves as a function of the wave number. We see that the spectrum has some sort of a plateau uh, between two character characteristic um, scales. And in fact, what we found is that there are some uh, 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 values of the parameters, which is such that there are so much gravitational waves being produced that uh, themselves start to dominate the universe content. And this, on the other hand, is impossible because, because gravitational waves will remain. They are not like the black holes. Black holes evaporate, hoping evaporate, but gravitational waves remain. So if they are produced at that time, they, are, they stay in the universe until now. And if they dominate the universe at the time of, 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 of uh, black hole domination, then they should dominate uh, even afterwards. And this is, of course, ruled out. So it means that when this happens, you know that this is impossible. And this, in fact, allows you to restrict the parameter space. And this is my final uh, plot, and I will just uh, um, move on to my conclusions. So this is a plot which um, uh, describes the mass of the primordial black holes in grams and the abundance of the primordial black holes at the time they form. And you have three regions in that plot. The first region is such that the abundance of uh, primordial black holes is too small for primordial, for primordial black holes to dominate. So even if they, their abundance increases because of the volume dilution effect, they will hopefully evaporate before they dominate the universe content. So this blue region is just as in the standard cosmological scenario. However, what is inside the green and the red is such that there is a phase of uh, primordial black hole domination. However, the red region is such that this phase is lasting too long, so you produce too many gravitational waves. Um, and this is ruled out because of this uh, gravitational wave back reaction uh, problem. And uh, okay, so we managed to find some analytical expression which uh, delineates uh, those two regimes. But the one thing that I would like to highlight um, uh, is that you see that this red region rules out any value of the mass for which the initial abundance of, of, of primordial black holes equals one. Which you see, if omega is one, this is always inside the forbidden red uh, region. And this means that primordial black holes can never dominate at the time of formation. So whenever you see, so coming back from this plot that I was showing before, where I have the amount of primordial black holes at the end of the instability phase, uh, in parameter space, inside this red triangle, um, uh, I found that um, uh, primordial black holes dominate already at the end of the instability, so already at the time that they form, and even later on, and, until they, have up, they evaporate. Well, all of this region is excluded because it lies along that line here. 
So you see this analysis is very useful to further constrain a parameter space and only the green uh, region is allowed. But again, inside this red region, you have something which is very non-trivial. You have a universe which has a transient uh, phase of primordial black hole domination, which produces some gravitational waves and uh, and we have um, um, some ongoing calculations about uh, what the signal will be and uh, whether it will be detectable by, by future gravitational wave experiments. But this changes in, in, in quite a substantial way the cosmological scenario. Okay, so let me just summarize in, in very briefly what I've uh, tried uh, to talk about. So what I've shown is that uh, at the end of inflation, the inflaton undergoes some oscillations at the bottom of its potential and that these oscillations give rise to uh, um, a parametric amplification, so to, so to the amplification of, uh, of fluctuations, of cosmological fluctuations. And this leads to the production of primordial black hole. Uh, something that I would like to highlight, especially for those of you who may work uh, a little bit on this uh, field, is that um, this happens in any model of inflation, right? Where you just have a minimum of the potential and you do not have to fine tune the parameters of the potential of the inflaton. So most of the uh, other ways to produce primordial black holes, they rely on um, um, tweaking the uh, uh, potential for the inflaton a little bit in such a way that during inflation, something funny happens. But when you work out the technical details of those models, most of the time you have to fine tune the potential a lot. And, 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 it and you have to assume also that, th that this is the actual potential for the inflaton while you have hundreds of models. Uh, in principle, so you cannot know that for, for sure. While this mechanism has no, doesn't have this problem because it happens in any potential, the only assumption is that you need to have a minimum, but this is a uh, local minimum, but this is the case for uh, the majority of, uh, of models. Um, what I've also shown is that this um, uh, mechanism for producing promodal black holes is so efficient that uh, promodal black holes can even dominate uh, the universe uh, afterwards before the Hawking evaporate. In that case, reheating, so reheating is the mechanism by which, uh, well, it's the usual mechanism by which the inflaton decays into standard model particles and those standard model particles thermalize. So the universe has a radiation era, reheating sets uh, the radiation era. In that case, the radiation era does not come from the decay of the inflaton and thermalization and so on, but it really comes from Hawking evaporation of the primordial black hole. So it's a completely different way to realize uh, reheating of the universe. And then at the final point, I've tried to explain that the stochastic background of gravitational waves uh, would be produced by such a uh, gas of primordial black holes. And that when you study the uh, amount, uh, the amplitude of this background, what you find is that uh, because it cannot be too large, you already exclude the uh, possibility that primordial black holes dominate straight upon their formation time. They can dominate afterwards because of the volume dilution effect, but not uh, already from the time that they form. And of course, uh, well, the next question is, can this be detected by future gravitational wave experiments and what is the signal, signal to be expected um, at these experiments? Okay, so with that, I, I will stop. I'm sorry, I think I'm maybe a little bit uh, too late, uh, but I just, uh, yeah, I thank you for your attention and I'm of course uh, happy to further discuss. Um, okay, I, I don't know if someone is, I can't hear anything. Uh, is everything working fine? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we are able to hear you. Okay, okay. So maybe I will just stop sharing so I can, can go back to the to the Zoom uh, view. Okay, so I, I hope it was uh, clear enough uh, and my connection was uh, okay.
Yes, sir, it was a very interesting lecture. Okay. Okay, so maybe, I don't know if there is, um, if there is no particular question, uh, shall I let you conclude or, or do you, I mean, I can, I mean, I'm happy to stay, of course. Uh, Excuse me, sir. Yes. Sir, do we have any experiments in the near future which uh, can pre predict, which can observe primordial black holes? Yes, yes. So this is a yeah, this is a very good question. So there are several ways that you could uh, say observe primordial black holes. So, so, so the thing is that in practice you observe black holes, and uh, or you might observe black holes. And the question is. Uh, well, can you tell whether this black hole is a primordial black hole or is, an or is just an astrophysical black hole? And there are a few ways that you can do that. Uh, for instance, the mass of the black hole is, an, is a, an important parameter. So if you want to form a black hole from astrophysical processes, what you can show is that there is a lower bound on the mass. So if you have a star which is less than a certain uh, mass, and, and that mass is 1.4 uh, solar masses, so if a star is, is lighter than 1.4 solar masses, it, it cannot give rise to a black hole, right? Because it cannot enter this uh, instability which leads to the gravitational uh, collapse. So for instance, the sun uh, will not end up in a, in a black hole. Um, however, primordial black holes, uh, as I've shown you, I, I've shown you that you can form very light primordial black holes, even so light that they will uh, Hawking evaporate quickly. But it means that you can form uh, primordial black holes uh, which have a mass uh, smaller than this uh, 1.4 uh, threshold. So what it means is that if you observe uh, a black hole, uh, the mass of which is less than 1.4 solar mass, then you, you can be sure that this is a primordial black hole right? because it cannot be astrophysical. And in that way, you, would, you will have proven the existence of primordial black holes. So this is one way. The other way is that uh, also the spin of uh, those black holes are different. Um, so, and, and the main idea is that, um, <coughs> sorry, when you form a primordial black hole, you have some density um, um, over. You have some yeah density fluctuation, which uh, immediately uh, gives rise to a black hole in the early universe. So you do not expect the black hole to spin uh, so much. While if you form a black hole from astrophysical processes, you have a star and the star collapses inside into something which is much, much smaller. And because of, well, basically because of conservation of angular momentum, if you have a very large object, even if it has a very small uh, spin, if you reduce its size dramatically like that, then the spin will be very large. So you expect astrophysical black holes to have a large spin and primordial black holes to have a low spin. And the spin of the black holes is something that you can constrain when uh, black holes merge and uh, emit gravitational waves. So for instance, LIGO and Virgo, uh, when they detect some gravitational wave event, they try to constrain the from the waveform of the gravitational wave, they try to constrain the masses of the black holes, but also their spins. And at that, and at that point, it's not really clear. So it, it seems that um, there are some in the statistical indications when you look at all the events that uh, um, at least a fraction of these events um, uh, stem from low spin black holes, and that could be in favor of the primordial origins, but we still need to gather some data. But as we move on and gather more data and have more accurate experiments, this is something that, this is something that we should be able to do, I think. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, so is there any any other question?
Mm -hmm. I guess that's all. Yeah. That was a really informative talk, sir. Yeah, thank you really very much for coming from your busy schedule. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation.